Okay, let's go ahead and get started. Um, so some minor things we need to cover and some major. Let me ask first. I, frankly, I forgot to bring my folder with my stuff from this class in it. Uh, I got in a hurry. Uh, is anybody supposed to present today in this class? In this, in some tutorials, uh, there are, there were people brave enough, brave enough to sign up to present in this uh, second week, and in some there was nobody brave enough. Uh, was your class brave enough or not? Uh, did anybody sign up to present today? No? Okay. Uh, I was thinking nobody did in this section, but uh, I wasn't sure. So I will present some of the stuff that they would have presented because I presume, um, i say it's past date, so I, I'm, I'm hoping we can uh, fill up the... Yeah, that we can, uh, that, that there will be other topics for people to cover. Um, I did also, I did not bring the sign up sheet. If anybody did not sign up to do a presentation, uh, then uh, you should maybe stop by my office after class or sometime, um, yeah, preferably this morning uh, or at least before 1 o'clock, and uh, sign up for your presentation so you know when it is and what it's going to be. Uh, we've had, uh, some of the students have had a hard time finding the textbook. This is an older version of it that I have. Um, if anybody happened to, to check out, if they happened to allow you to check out the textbook uh, from the library, they were not supposed to allow anybody to check it out. They were supposed to just let people have it for four hours and make a copy and do whatever they need to do in four hours. But uh, other people have gone in and nobody can seem to find either of the two textbooks that uh, uh, that they're supposed to have in the library. If you uh, get to the point where it's your turn, it's getting close to your turn, and you need your chapter, and it's uh, uh, and you can't get the book in the library, then you can borrow mine quickly to go copy it and bring it right back uh, because this is the only one I know I can that that, that no exists. Let me put it that way. I I can only let you borrow it for like 30 minutes to go copy your chapter and then bring it back. I prefer not having you teach out of this one, uh, do your presentation out of this one, because this is an older version. This is the 8th edition, and the ones in the in the library are the 10th edition, so it's actually two editions old. So I'd rather not be teaching out of this one, but I have this one as backup in case we have no choice. Um, there are even, there's at least, I think at least one chapter that doesn't exist in this one. And on the other hand, this one has two chapters that don't exist in the other one. So, um, again, I'm kicking myself for not bringing my sign-up sheet because I did send you out a, uh, uh, or I did post an announcement, and you should have gotten an email telling, giving you the announcement if you signed up for our Moodle, uh, for the, the course in, on the Moodle site. Uh, you should have gotten those emails. Uh, in fact, another email today. The one that I sent previously, whenever that was, um, did let you know that uh, there have been some changes. I guess I must have sent that on Monday as I realized that, that we had yesterday off um, and let you know that how we were going to handle that. In essence, um, any student presentations that were scheduled this week will be made this week by with, with the in the uh, uh, in the sections that do meet this week and those that that were scheduled yesterday, the two sections that were, lab sections that were scheduled yesterday, we'll have to present next week. So I'm pushing, uh, after next week, I'm pushing all the assignments, all the presentation assignments back one week. So if you were originally scheduled to do your presentation in week three, that will now become week four because next week we'll be wrapping up this week because of the day off. Uh, and it happens to coordinate that this week we had Tuesday off and next week we'll have Wednesday off. So it's, uh, uh, so again, if you were scheduled to present on week three, you are now week four and everybody pushes back one week. Uh, also, uh, as I mentioned, uh, this book has two chapters that don't exist in the current book. Uh, and those happen to be the last two chapters. They're kind of short and so I uh, it was the very last thing in our list, and if anybody signed up for that last thing in our list, which was chapters 15 and 16, that has now been changed to chapter 1. I didn't have chapter 1 scheduled to be, be presented by anybody. has a lot of similar information as 
as presentations as the chapters 15 and 16. So if anybody signed up to do chapters 15 and 16, those two short last chapters, it's you now have the assignment of teaching chapter one out of the textbook instead. Uh, I also did open up one more. I had a blank spot and I uh, I did fill, make uh, another presentation available there. Again, if uh, I hope we're not going to run out of presentations um, caused by the fact that nobody signed up to do this week, but um, if we do, I'll, uh, I'm, I'm trying to keep it down to two presentations a week, 15 minutes a piece, so that we only spend about a half an hour on the presentations and then have uh, the other hour and a half to do other stuff. Um, okay, today I sent out a uh, another announcement, or I posted another announcement, which uh, you should have again gotten an email saying that there was a posting, and, and uh, perhaps also carrying with it a, an attachment. And that is, while we're moving back the presentations, the student presentations, we aren't moving back the assignment. So uh, by Friday night, you are supposed to hand in your uh, your minor project number one. Again, it's only worth 1% of your entire grade. So it's not, you know, if you don't do it, you're not going to, you know, burn and, you know, crash and burn. But uh, that's when it's due. And uh, uh, I did post uh, on the uh, Moodle site. Do I have that open here? So uh, besides the announcements this morning, I also posted a uh, under week two. I did post, basically it's, it's the same page as I had in my presentation last week, the, my, uh, the instructions and two, two models of what you, I'm expecting you to hand in by Friday night. Uh, and so that, but I just took out those slides from last week's PowerPoint and made them into their own document. So you have that to remind you how to do the project, particularly if you weren't in attendance last week. You can quickly look at this minor project one instructions and model. It only has two examples, and you are to do give us uh, as your assignment. You're to hand in three story story ideas, but this shows you what sort of information you're supposed to give me with your story idea with your three story ideas. Now, again, these are to be real story ideas. These will be produced in our in our publications. They will be posted on our Facebook site. Uh, other people will see your news stories um, uh, at some point uh, starting somewhere around midterm, they'll start reading your stories. Your stories, again, should be somewhat timeless. They should not be event-oriented and become dated very quickly because uh, people may still be reading them six months from now. So try to um, make your stories issue-oriented uh, or people-oriented, like a feature story on somebody. Uh, the question was asked, Can we? Then does that mean these are soft soft stories, soft feature stories. Oh, they can be soft feature stories. They can also be soft, I'm not sure soft's the right word. They can be, again, issue-oriented stories are not soft stories. They're just timeless stories. So, for example, we have an election coming up um, right now in this country, and will there be an impact on, um, yeah, on students, on, uh, on this university? Uh, for example, uh, this the the uh, granting of permission for Chiman University was created by the uh, by the old by the well the current administration. If there was a change in administration, would the new administration look upon our university the same? I don't know. We don't know. Nobody really knows. Um, you know, there's all sorts of uh, questions that you know. So you can take a a current. Um, you can take an issue and it can become become timeless, and that doesn't make it a soft story. Uh, in fact, that can be one of the hardest no stories. That can be an investigative story. Uh, so, so just because it's timeless does not make it a feature story and does not make it a soft story. 
Uh, it just makes it timeless. And you're covering issues that nobody else is covering. It still stays news until somebody reads it, uh, unless somebody else writes your story for another publication. You know, so if your if your story becomes, you know, if somebody else, if uh, if the star reads your story and says, "Gee, we should have done that story," then maybe your story becomes dated because it ends up on the front page of the star. Not exactly your your work, but they got your idea, and so they 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 replicated your story in essence themselves. That is possible. Um, and in essence, uh, I mean, there was not just possible, it happens in the real world quite often. But until, if you're doing a timeless story, it is basically news until it's no longer new to people. And so, uh, and you, you know, if you have not dated, if you've not tied it to an event, especially uh, with the example I just gave relating to the, the, the election, you can mention the election, but that doesn't make your, that doesn't make your uh, issue uh, time connected, especially, because the issue is what will be the results of the election. So you can mention the election as a as an event that has a, a, you know a timeliness to it, but that doesn't make your issue. Uh, it, it doesn't make it uh, may make it a little bit less timeless, but not necessarily a lot less timeless because it will take a while uh, for us to know if, uh, if, if we have a new administration, it would take quite a while to really get a sense of what changes are going to be made. So if you're, if you're interviewing, uh, professors and administrators and students as to what they think the impact would be, and, and, and this is just one, you know, just a kind of a crazy example I'm thinking of right at the moment, uh, if you were, you know, interviewing all those people, that doesn't become dated until until we get down the road a while and, and the administration makes itself very clear what its feelings are towards China and certain University um, and perhaps the country of China. I mean, we don't know, you know, it's kind of one of those things like if you were to take the Trump administration, it takes a while for you to understand is Trump going to be a friend or an enemy if you're looking at him internationally uh, because you just don't know. Uh, he doesn't, uh, you know, he doesn't reveal himself in all ways, and sometimes he says one thing and then he does something else, uh, so you, you can't be sure, and that'd be true of some other politicians too. You can't be sure until they actually do it, and you judge them by what they actually do. So my point is uh, simply that timeless does not mean a feature story. It can be a feature story. I'm not ruling out feature stories, but... Um, I might actually, I guess, if I were to tell you a, a, a little bit of bias, it would be for somebody doing a timeless news story. Uh, that would actually can be considered hard news. Just because it's not tied to an event does not mean it's not hard. Like I say, it can, that can be a, an investigative story. It can be lots of things that is not related to time, especially uh, an, an event in particular. Uh, you also will upload your... Uh, your uh, minor project one will be done in Word, and you will upload it uh, into Moodle right there where I'm pointing. So uh, if, if anybody has any problems, let me know. Hopefully you won't. Let me go back then to the PowerPoint and... There were some things that I did not cover on Monday, uh, at least well enough, I want to go over a little bit today. Um, I guess it wasn't actually in the PowerPoint, it's in the critique sheets, so I guess I'll move on to that. Um, thought I had them open. Here's, okay, we'll cover this one first. I have it open here. Uh, some of you have taken another class from me where you had uh, responsibilities to do a presentation. And so let me just uh, review this real quickly. Uh, your assignment this time will be a little bit different in that you are doing them individually and they're only 15 minutes long. That means there's, if you're assigned an entire chapter, there's absolutely no way to cover that chapter in 15 minutes. Uh, and so that's not what I'm asking you to do. I'm asking you to find what you feel are the most important aspects of the chapter. So that does mean that you have to review the chapter rather carefully. Uh, if you, if it's obvious to me that you just grab some stuff out of it that 
were not the most important things or anywhere close to the most important things, you, you, you could get a lower grade for that. So I want you to spend enough time in the chapter to get a feeling for what really are the most important parts of the chapter. That doesn't necessarily mean you have to read the entire chapter because you may be able to figure out from subheadline, headlines, subheadlines, charts, pictures, and come up with a pretty good idea. It might take you an hour or so reviewing that chapter to come out, okay, this is what I need to do, and then you can just uh, you know center your presentation on those specific parts of the chapter and uh, not necessarily have read the entire chapter word for word, but gone through it enough to come up with a pretty good idea of what's important and what's not important. Uh, so, um, again, you'll only cover 15 minutes, uh, you know, or th that portion which is, you can cover in 15 minutes. The, uh, not uh, much of any change from, uh, if you did this for in uh, history or one of the other classes I may have taught you in. Um, again, about uh, one quarter of your grade. By the way, these are, this is worth only 4%. So basically when I say one quarter, I'm saying one point is based on uh, the high quality of your uh, visual aids. Uh, how well did you uh, did you use, I, sorry, I, see I did a typo, uh, PowerPoint and other visual aids. Were they readable, attractive, not excessively detailed, but adequate to cover the key points, appropriate for the material presented? Remember slides are to carry key points, not your script. Uh, did your PowerPoint slides force the audience to choose between listening and reading? That cognitive conflict is not a good thing. So, in other words, there are some people who, who put essentially their entire script on a slide. Uh, that is not the purpose of PowerPoint. Uh, and that's, I've seen a lot more of that in Asia than I did in America. I think maybe, I mean, it was created in America, maybe it was more obvious. I don't know. I, I haven't seen the amount of overload on slides typically in America that I sometimes see in Asia. Uh, some people, including professors I've, that I've, uh, whose presentations I've attended, have way overloaded a slide. What I'm trying to explain in this, uh, this first uh, aspect of your grade is that if you're putting a whole bunch of text on your slide and somebody's talking, that causes cognitive conflict. There is no way they can read a slide with 200 words on it, or you know, I'm going to the extreme, but I have seen slides with, with 200 words on them, and listen at the same time, unless you're absolutely reading from that, that slide. Then maybe they can follow it that way. But, typically, but especially, especially if you have a lot of words and, they, and it's not exactly what you're saying, that creates cognitive conflict, uh, where you can't pay attention to both. And in fact, it will hurt your, your paying attention to either. Because you're trying, your mind is trying to figure out what am I looking at here? What am I, what am I going to focus on? What he's saying or what it says on the on the slide? And so you actually will hurt both your cognition of the slide and your cognition of of the spoken word by creating that conflict. Now, so the point of a of a slide of a PowerPoint slide is to only have the main ideas, so you can very quickly glance and and, uh, and understand. Okay, he's talking about this point, he's going to talk about this point, he's going to talk about this point, and, and that doesn't create the conflict. So a slide ideally would have, you know, probably no more than 25 words on it, uh, something like that, and even that could be too much. Could, it depends also on just exactly how they're presented, but that may even be the high end. Uh, I try to avoid that. There are times when there might be charts or something where you do leave the whole thing on there, and it is maybe excessive, but uh, it's a table, for example. You have a table, and you're, you're showing, so people don't really have to read that closely in the table. They get the idea, okay, this is a table showing the, the decrease in uh, unemployment uh, over the last 10 years or something. Um, and so you're kind of quickly getting the idea of the chart, and you don't necessarily read every word of it. So, you know, something like that could be more words and not really cause that much conflict. But bottom line is don't be too wordy on your slides. Those are to be key points, not to be your script. Uh, don't cause that cognitive conflict or you will be penalized. Uh, second part, high quality of content. Uh, did you cover the topic adequately, giving emphasis to the key points and not giving so much detail that listeners could not digest it all? 
Uh, was it accurate, complete, coherent, smooth, and relevant to the audience? Did it flow well and link ideas with a unifying theme? Uh, so again, this is about contents. Did you choose, uh, this would also be going back to the idea in this case where you're not covering the entire chapter, you're not expected to cover the entire chapter, did you choose well what you presented? Uh, was it clear? Was it important? Uh, and did you, uh, some of these items, the bullet items under it are also important. Um, did you choose the most important, most interesting information? Well, that's what I was just saying. Uh, did you then thus eliminate unnecessary and uninteresting information? Did you exhibit graphic illustration to enhance uh, visual learners' understanding? Did you exemplify concepts with appropriate examples that epitomize that idea? Um, that is one of the problems I see a lot in student presentations is they don't, uh, they, they give a definition, they don't give an example. And therefore, it's very difficult for somebody to understand without an example if, if the definition itself is a little bit obscure. Um, I think I've taught in other classes, but I'll repeat here. Back, I can still remember a class I took uh, in, it would have been in 1971, probably. Uh, 72, maybe. Uh, in other words, a long time ago. I can still remember that class because uh, the teacher, it was an education class, and the teacher taught that to re for a person to really understand, for you to actually deliver to a student, um, a, a full comprehension of a concept, you need four things. You do need definition. You need to define it for them. Uh, but you also have to uh, then illustrate it. Maybe not illustration can be verbal il illustration or, or uh, graphic illustration, but you need to illustrate it to them, let them help to the degree possible, help them to see what you're talking about in their mind's eye, if not in their literal eyes. The third one is to compare it. Compare it to other things that are similar to it. And the last one is contrast it. Uh, in other words, you're showing what is different than. So you have a new concept, you're defining it, you're illustrating it, you're comparing it to other things that are similar, and you're contrasting it with things that are not similar, that are very different. And that's how you totally comprehend a concept. Now, I don't expect that, that in every concept you teach that you will do all four of those things necessarily. But if it's necessary to understand, you should or you should do as many of those four things as necessary for people to understand what you're talking about. That also means fewer concepts to teach, and that's a good thing. I mean, it's good for you to know that you don't have to teach all the concepts, but it's uh, important for you to understand if it's an important concept, teach it well enough that people understand it, and that would, depend, that would require more of those four things, not just a definition. Because when we start getting a new concept, the definition, definition of by itself does not do the job. You need to do more than just the definition. So um, your contents are, are, are important and includes all of those things. The third item then is your delivery. Uh, do you deliver your presentation well? Do you have a, a, an interesting introduction? Or I've seen, you know, Maybe I've done it. I, I try not to do it, but I, so I've heard some students especially saying, you know, starting off with something like, well, this is kind of a boring subject, but, uh, you know, and they go on from there. Well, if you're always telling people this is boring, uh, guess what? You're not going to excite people to listen to you. So that's the last thing you should do, and hopefully you don't go that far. Uh, but try to come up with, as, as you develop your PowerPoint, it's like writing a news story. You want your whammy up front. You want your hook up front. So when you're very, right off the bat, you want to grab their attention with something. So if you can do that, I'll be paying attention and I will reward you for it. Uh, even if I don't always do that. Nonetheless, I know that's best practices. Um, enunciate clearly. Uh, use appropriate grammar. Uh, I need to be able to understand you. Uh, emphasize the important concepts in a way that makes them memorable. Again, this may also, this kind of overlaps with your contents because if you're going to make it memorable, it may also mean going back to those four ideas of how to teach a concept. Um, did, as you talk, are you giving the definition and giving an illustration and comparing and contrasting when necessary for people to understand? So this is also part of your presentation. So it overlaps between contents 
and presentations when you start um, uh, well with this one one aspect of it uh, did you did you emphasize important concepts did you explain concepts clearly same thing uh, also did you uh, maintain eye contact that's very important uh, did you speak with more than just your mouth? In other words, uh, your body language, uh, whether it be uh, hand gestures, uh, but definitely eye contact. Uh, are you, you know, if you're uh, maintaining eye contact, uh, this it is difficult in this room. I mean, right now, I see people, see most people are not looking at me, so it's hard for me to maintain eye contact if people aren't looking at me, obviously. Um, but nonetheless, I will be rewarding you for you rewarding you for trying to maintain eye contact even if nobody's looking at you. Uh, that's that's a them problem, not a, not your problem. Uh, it still makes for a better video, if nothing else. Um, and I will, you know, be video recording you probably. I may not, I may or may not put it up. I'm not putting up all the, uh, I'm not putting all of the uh, uh, tutorial videos on Moodle. I'm typically choosing the best one. So last week you only noticed that I put up one tutorial. I thought adequately covered the content of, of our tutorial. I did not post four of them. Uh, that would take a lot of space and take a lot of time, and I don't think it's necessary. So where possible, I'm just going to post one video of, of a tutorial that I think is covering things. So, uh, for example, where there is no student presentation today in this class, this may not be the one I post. I may go ahead, I think tonight a student is presenting, or students are presenting tonight. So I'm, that may be the one I, I post because there will be student presentations on, on two of the topics, on the first two topics. So that may get posted. Um, do you elicit feedback? Um, that can be done in an overt way or not so overtly, but nonetheless your, your eye contact is part of that. But uh, are you eliciting feedback? Uh, where you only have 15 minutes, you don't necessarily need, uh, I would back off on that. I wouldn't grade that real hard because that would then diminish your ability to cover the subject. So, But at the end, uh, we'll cover that in a second, you are supposed to create some questions, and that is inviting feedback. And so that's part of the, the next, the last uh, uh, point. Uh, we'll be creating questions, and that would be your feedback then anyway. Um, again, elaborate in verbal and nonverbal ways. Energize. Try to keep up your energy, your enthusiasm. Again, that helps uh, keep people in tune. And ideally, end with something memorable uh, that uh, uh, that they, well, by definition, if it's memorable, that they will remember. Obviously, so uh, try to kind of wrap it up in a way that they remember. Uh, then, in the last part, uh, did the presentation start on time? Were your Presenters uh, ready and prepared. Did they keep the presentation within a specified reasonable time limit? Did the presenters provide me with, again, note, 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 provide me with a digital and printed copy of their slides before the the presentation? In other words, I, I don't want to have to go looking for you later to find your digital version if I choose to put it up on the Internet. That I might put everybody's digital version or their PowerPoint up on the Internet because that doesn't take very long. So I could I could put all the digital versions on the internet. Um, the uh, but meanwhile I would like a printed copy just for my grading purposes, so I can kind of follow along and take notes. On and it does not have to. Uh, I know in some of the other classes people gave me full slides. I don't want full slides. I want it in you know like six per page or something, and I, that's adequate for me to take notes on. So don't don't print out your whole presentation for me one slide per page, uh, six per page is fine. But I want something to write notes on. So you are to give me a printed copy uh, before you start, and I should, at least by the time I get back to my office, I should see that digital version because I'll be uploading. As soon as I get done with this class, I start processing my video. I start uploading stuff to the Internet. I don't want to have to come looking for you. So to uh, get a good grade, uh, you should be sending me your PowerPoint, digital version of your PowerPoint ahead of time and handing me a printed copy of, of the six per page slides. Um, it's kind of like bonus points. You, you won't necessarily not get an A if you don't do it, but, but if somebody um, does anything that's beyond, above and beyond 
the chapter that is significant. Uh, for example, um, if they've updated, if the chapter is a little bit outdated and they find a way to update it, I would take note of that and reward them for it. If it's uh, this book is made in America, if somebody found that it was uh, valuable to, to localize it, give us some local information, I would reward them for that. Uh, if uh, all the examples you have in the book are from the West, uh, or the other book we have for design is from Europe, if you uh, if you were doing a, a, a um, you know presentation on newspaper design, if you took examples out of the Star or other local newspapers, that would be localizing it. So you know there are ways to go a little bit above and beyond without taking a lot more time necessarily, but taking a little bit more, you know, taking a little doing a little updating, a little bit localizing without taking, without diminishing um, the, the contents of the book, uh, but enhancing it, then that's a good thing. Uh, and then, as I said, finally, you should be doing uh, some uh, objective questions at the end in review. That, by the way, could go beyond the 15 minutes. So your presentation will be 15 minutes. Uh, you should be starting on your questions by the end of the 15 minutes, but because that might elicit discussion, I'm not going to uh, count that the entire discussion of the questions as part of your 15 minutes. So you could go a little bit beyond, you know, maybe 20 minutes if you're if you're counting your questions and review of the questions with the students, uh, but uh, not any longer than that. So the questions review of the questions is, is uh, beyond the 15 minutes. So you should be giving the right answers. So you're asking questions that represent the content that you've just presented to them, and you're giving them answers because your questions and your answers may be part of my quizzes and or even the final exam. Uh, the better you make them, the more likely you will, that will be the case, and the more likely you'll know the answer because you created the question. So it's a good thing to write good questions and to give good answers, cover, cover important subjects with your questions. Uh, because then I may use those. So, um, I don't hear, I guess, give the exact uh, number of questions. I would say at least three, at least three questions uh, for your 15-minute presentation. Um, I wouldn't go beyond five, so three to five at the maximum, three minimum, five maximum. Okay. So I will, any questions on your presentation? Um, again, most of you have done presentations for me before, but I may not have always explained in advance the, some of the details I wanted you to think about and emphasize, and I never restricted you to 15 minutes before, I don't think. So uh, this, uh, and uh, in, in history, you were doing it as a team, now you're doing it individually. So there are some differences in uh, this assignment to what you may have done in the past. Okay, I'm going to close that. And I want to review again a little bit more in a little more depth your uh, news writing assignment, since that's uh, your first major assignment coming up. Uh, and I did just very quickly go over it the other day. I'm going to move this my picture out of the way again. Uh, again, your stories should be. Uh, I, Put in here between 600 and 1,000 words, so 600. Uh, the example I give you at the end of this is 700, approximately 700 words, uh, to give you an idea of what that you know, what that length means. Um, I guess I don't totally rule out going over 1,000 words. If you have something that you think is really valuable and, and you want to uh, do such a wonderful job covering a very tough subject or whatever, uh, I, I wouldn't say you can't do that. But uh, I would, you know, be uh, somewhat reluctant to go over a thousand words unless you really have a killer story that uh, you think I'm going to appreciate. Then, then fine. Uh, one thing that I put in here that uh, was not in uh, uh, was not in previous critique sheets uh, was uh, it is against the rules to plagiarize yourself. Obviously, you don't plagiarize other people. Uh, you can. I mentioned you can take an idea from the star or something and and use that idea to develop your story. You might even take a few statistics or a little bit of information um, from that 
uh, cite either the star, if you were in that example, or if they got their information from a state agency, then cite the state agency. Uh, you know, go to the, the most original source that you can. So you can cite other publications if that's where you kind of initiated your, uh, your story. Uh, but that's not the same as plagiarizing. If you start using their words, then that's plagiarizing, and you will get a zero for the, the, the project. So you don't want to do that. Uh, but what I mean by self-plagiarizing is if you did something for another class, uh, then if you basically just redo it for this class, don't. That, that is self-plagiarizing. We want students to do their original work and do more than just one throughout their career, not just redo the same one over and over again. Uh, I know uh, some students, and not just here, but in, in, uh, in Kazakhstan, uh, I didn't think about that, and, and I kind of late in my nine years there found that some students were plagiarizing themselves and just resubmitting stories they had submitted to somebody else already. Uh, and that's, that's not the intention of, a, of an assignment, is to just do something you've already done before. That's not right. Um, does that mean you can't even use the idea that you used before? Well, no, you could use the idea, but it has to be significantly different. You should update with new sources and new information. Um, but I would hesitate to even take the same idea. I would think it'd be better for you to take a whole new, uh, uh, take a whole new story. But for one thing, um, when you start looking for a job, you should have a portfolio of stories that you've written, of pages you've designed in this class with, uh, with desktop publishing, depending on the job you're doing. But even if your job is quite different, you may not think, for example, let's say you go after a TV job. And you think to yourself, why would I put in my portfolio uh, some products that I created with desktop publishing? Uh, well, you don't know why yet. Uh, but for example, TV stations are starting to post more news on their website. If they know that you have skills in, in uh, writing news as well as uh, you know covering it with video, and that extends to desktop publishing, which is the best, is a, is a method that creates the best looking documents online is desktop publishing. Uh, you can do it with HTML, but you don't have the control with HTML that you have with desktop publishing to make it look really nice. And so it may be that they, on their website, they're producing, uh, they would like to produce anyway, a product that is based on PDF rather than HTML in order to make it look better. Um, I don't know. You just don't know sometimes when a, a skill that you think is not related suddenly becomes related. I think I mentioned, I may have mentioned before that I, uh, in the 1980s, I took a class in, in uh, database management, database creation and management. I had no idea, idea why I was doing it except because I was teaching at the university, I, had a, I could take it as a free class. I thought, well, I want to know more about computers, I'll take one in database. Uh, I had absolutely no idea that it would ever be important to me. Uh, but then about four years later, I took a job in marketing. Still, when I took the job, I had no idea a database would be important to me. Well, database became one of the most important tools I had in marketing because uh, with databases, you can start individualizing products in a, in a very, uh, well, it, it, it expedites it, let me put it this way. You can do it faster. It expedites your producing individualized products. Um, and so I was able to do stuff with database that nobody else in the industry, none of my competitors were doing. They didn't know databases. I knew database, how to create a database. They did not know how to do it. Uh, I created forms that they, that they were doing with a typewriter. I created on, on, uh, on access database. Uh, by doing an access, I could also create, recreate the forms. And so, uh, because I made them in Access Database, I could also customize them with a touch of a few buttons. Whereas they were hesitant to retype the entire page, because they didn't know how to do it with a database, they would send the same stuff in, the same forms to lots of prospective clients over and over and over again that were very generic in nature, whereas with a few touches of buttons, I could customize mine and send only the most appropriate uh, the description and photos of just the most appropriate uh, examples of our work that related to the new project we were we were bidding on with a with a engineering and architectural design firm. Uh, so 
I didn't know it was going to be valuable, it became extremely valuable. And I became good enough at it that the university then gave me a separate contract to help them build a new database uh, for their marketing efforts. Uh, and so I had no idea those things were going to happen. It has continued to be valuable to me. Uh, I use a database um, when I have a, a, a doing a when I'm doing a an email based survey. I can individualize the email to people, so it's not I can individualize printed letters and send out you know in one touch of a button send out 200 letters with the individual's name and their inside address and talking about their organization. I can touch one button out it comes again where somebody else is typing you know doing one letter after another letter after another letter letter. Uh, I can do that in email also. And so I can, if I'm sending out, uh, I've sent out sometimes 20,000 or more emails at one time. Every one of those can be individualized if I have a database that have, has individualized uh, information on it. Uh, so my point is simply, I didn't know the database was going to be at all important in my career. And here it became one of the most important things in my career. Uh, so you don't know why one, some skill that you have achieved, such as desktop publishing, is going to be valuable to you when you go when you start applying for certain jobs. Uh, I would include it in your portfolio. Maybe you rearrange your portfolio a little bit, but showing that you know desktop publishing could be very valuable to you. Um, so that's just one example. Um, so. You want a, a big portfolio. You want to have an example of all the things you can do in your portfolio. And so you want more stories, is I guess what I was where, where I was really starting from. You don't want to redo the same story after, one after you know time after time, even though it may help you kind of cheat and make it easier for you to get a good grade. It's not good for you if you're preparing to be a professional. Uh, if you want to be an amateur all your life, go ahead. Um, but it said uh, some uh, one professor taught you have to write a million words before before you become a good writer. I don't know if I don't think there's any any law that says you have to write a million words before you become a good writer. But you have to write a lot to become a good writer. And so if you're re trying to redo your assignments uh, to to get a good grade quickly and because you're lazy, whatever, not a good idea for you or for anybody else. Uh, and Professors, they know that, will penalize you for it. So don't do it in this class. Uh, we've talked about leads before. Uh, this gives an example of a speech interview lead. Again, uh, same as uh, in, a, in the history class uh, that some of you may have taken. I may have expanded this a little bit from what you saw when you were taking my history class. Uh, an example of a complete lead, two paragraph complete lead. And you, you should take a look at that. Use multiple sources. Again, uh, in, in this, uh, for your stories, no less than three sources, uh, live sources. You want to uh, attribute essentially every paragraph. And this one talks about how to, uh, uh, how to, how to, to refer to people the first time by a full name, as in this example, Professor Ken Harvey. And after that, it's just Harvey said. So just last name. After that, by AP style. Again, individual newspapers may want you to put the courtesy title in front of it, but the exact AP style is uh, no. Uh, by the way, I did notice uh, I gave you a digital version of the 2005, and I just noticed somebody else did order AP style books for the library. So there's like five copies or so of the 2000. I think it's 2015. It's a fairly updated one. Uh, so uh, if you want to see the, um, if you're presenting or just want to see and experience the, uh, the full AP style book, uh, it is, uh, there are multiple copies in the library. Uh, I'm not, not going to reiterate some of the stuff I've talked about before. Be, one, be very careful. A lot of people in other classes have been dinged by not keeping uh, this uh, E, number 2E here. Um, be specific about what was said. Don't write uh, the speaker spoke about freedom in America. Instead, be specific and write something like, the speaker says competition of ideas is the key to maintaining freedom in America. In other words, tell us what uh, 
uh, what they said, not what they talked about. Uh, you can particularly catch, if you ever use the word about, ask yourself whether you just uh, committed this error. Uh, because it, it's pretty hard to use the word about without being so general that you're not really telling us specifics. So just look for that word. Uh, that's not the only way you can have a, a, an empty sentence in news. But it is a primary way when you start talking about what somebody said or about um, you know, what, uh, what, particularly what they said. They talked about something. That is empty. There's nothing there of value, uh, hardly at all. Maybe in some cases it's important to, to, you know, that you don't have time to cover everything, and there, but you feel like you should let the reader know a little bit more what was spoken about. But ask yourself whether that has any news value at all. And very frequently has none. Uh, so avoid talking, you know, uh, quotes that are that indirect quotes that say what people talk about and not give specifics. Of course, uh, you know, your language, not excessive wordiness. We talked about that. You know, use simple words, simple phrases, simple sentences, sim simple paraphrases or paragraphs. I went through that yesterday. Uh, Make sure things flow well, and that frequently goes back to what I mentioned in class the other day, where you're intertwining your quotes and paraphrases, because your paraphrases help guide where you're going in your story. You have control over the paraphrases since you're not quoting anybody. It doesn't have to be exact anybody's exact words, but when you're paraphrasing or using indirect quote, it gives you more latitude in steering people through your story, uh, where they're at, whereas direct quotes have their value by having those details, including some emotion, including some personality. Uh, so you want the direct quotes, but they it's hard. To, if you used only direct quotes, it would be a very choppy story. You don't want a choppy story that doesn't isn't coherent, doesn't flow well. And so you use your direct quotes to give personality and emotion and so forth. And you give you use the paraphrases or indirect quotes to steer your story. Uh, steer the reader through your story, point to point. Um, and you, again, I have an example that you can look at and hopefully comprehend it a little bit better. Um, I've added, since some of you took history, some detail on, uh, on the type 1, type 2, type 3 quotes that I spoke about yesterday. I gave, showed you examples, or Monday I mean, showed you examples of what type 1, type 2, type 3 meant. One thing I point out here, I go ahead and give two examples of a type 3. I mentioned type 3 can be one sentence split with your attribution or two sentences split with your attribution. Um, and so uh, in this case, uh, you pay for paid advertising, comma, quotation mark, how you see it, comma, quotation mark, lowercase b, but it blends in with unpaid content, including some of your own. So this is an example of, of type 3 where your attribution is in the middle of a, a sentence. And so that's a little different. This part particularly is different than when you go to two sentences. So uh, down here, native advertising is one reason why on the internet the company would be crazy not to practice innovative marketing communication slash IMC comma quotation mark hard set. Now here's the difference. New sentence now. So this one was not a new sentence. That was breaking the sentence in half. This one's a new sentence. And now we put a period here, quotation mark, and a capital letter, the, because it's a whole new sentence. So type 3 thing confuses people sometimes because they, they don't quite understand how to make how to make this quickly right in here. It depends on whether you're splitting a complete sentence or splitting two sentences in the same paragraph. But still type 3. Your attribution's in the middle of your paragraph. It's still considered type 3. But it's the punctuation and how you handle it in this area after the attribution is different. Here it's a new sentence. Here it was the same sentence that you're splitting. So different uh, comma here, uh, period down here, or this at, uh, period here, quotation, quotation, yeah, lowercase b here, uppercase b here. So uh, both of them are type three, but one is splitting one sentence in half, and one is, is splitting the pair is two sentences in the same paragraph. So it's still in the middle, but a different situation. 
Um, the other ones are a little bit easier to understand. Type two, uh, your your uh, attributions at the end, and uh, you should know how to definitely know how to do handle the punctuation with these. Content, I may have uh, changed a little bit here. I mentioned plagiarism here, including self-plagiarism. Uh, so I added that. Um, quality of information, again, don't just throw in the first five quotes you can find. Emphasize interesting stuff in the story. Uh, uh, interesting, accurate, incredible, or is it interesting, accurate, and quick, credible throughout? So that's part of what I'm looking at. It's 30% of the grade is still content. It's not I think in the history class I made that 50%, but now it's 30%. It is still important. It's the most important, uh, I'm still saying. But uh, the your lead and your lead was 20% now. Your attribution is 20% now. Your language is 20% now. And so that uh, leaves 30% for content. And then still the formatting, inverted pyramid if it's appropriate, uh, short paragraphs, uh, that is worth 10%. So you should review that. Uh, I took the example that I've been using in history, most recently anyway. Um, this, uh, as I mentioned, is a story that I somewhat fabricated. Obviously, I don't want you fabricating your story, but this was only for, uh, for illustration purposes only. Uh, so um, anyway, understand that. You're telling the truth. I'm making some stuff up here. The... Uh, so your lead, your complete lead with the green, your trans, your bridge with the uh, uh, blue, and then into the body of your story. Um, within that, again, look at how I've made it flow. So just kind of going through it real quick. So the lead is, is typically not a direct quote. That's very rare. Making it a direct quote, typically an indirect quote if it's a speech interview. Marketing and PR in the 21st century are undergoing dramatic changes, says David W. Guth, an American public relations expert visiting Malaysia. Um, in this case, I did make it time uh, related, uh, but uh, so this is not uh, the timeless sort of story necessarily. I, I could have rewritten this a little bit and made it timeless pretty easily, but uh, I got, went in and left the time element in. Uh, Guth was the keynote speaker, da da da, da gives the rest of the five W's in paragraph two. Then transitions using a direct quote that reflects the indirect quote that I used in the lead with the development of databases and the ability to capture data off the internet. Uh, PR and marketing are becoming more individualized. They can hardly be called mass marketing or mass communications anymore, said Guth. So this was very vague, uh, undergoing dramatic changes, said Guth. Down here is more specific in the direct quote, gives some personality, but also gives detail that weren't included in the lead. Uh, and now, But it still brings us back to the same point. How did it change dramatically? And then start going through the, the story. Uh, does it mention some other people? We're at the conference. Um, and uh, again, this is an example of what they talked about, but this gives specifics. So instead of saying they talked about integrated marketing communication, for example, they explained that mark in integrated marketing communication, I and see and other forms of consumer-focused marketing are uprooting the notion of mass marketing by helping organizations customize their messages to target groups and directly communicate with individuals over the internet and with other forms of modern communication. So that is a paragraph that could that some that an amateur might very well make an about sentence. It's not an about. It doesn't have to be an about sentence. You can start getting some detail. And then uh, great quote, in the 21st century, marketing means building relationships with individual consumers, and that's good news for public relations, said and yeah. Uh, there are some secrets, Yao said, on how to conduct a winning IMC uh, campaign to target individuals rather than mass audiences. These include that you can use some bullet items if it's uh, to, uh, but your bullet items should be informative. And they should stand alone. You should not use bullet items that are so vague that you don't understand that they give no news either. So in this case, these are complete sentences. Focus on individual consumers, for example. So each of these is a complete sentence that does give newsworthy information. So if you're going to use bullets, make sure they're newsworthy bullets. Don't just 
again, bullets can sometimes be used in an about way, in a way that doesn't tell you what you spoke about and gives you no information worth telling us. So you need to make sure your bullets are not about sentences themselves, but they're giving us details that is uh, that are of value in our story. Um, and I would say in a, in a news story, I would very rarely use more than one set of bullets. Uh, uh, avoid that. If you use more than one, I'm going to be looking real um, real closely at it to see if I think it can is worthwhile, or whether you're just working late. So again, uh, another indirect quote, Harvey said that inbound marketing tactics such as offering free games, webinars, and ebooks get people to share their, per their personal information through a registration process. Quote, with the increasing focus on building two-way win-win relationships uh, with important public, modern marketing tools pretty much dictate the use of an integrated marketing approach, Harvey said, and what used to be considered public relations has now become central to the entire marketing process. Anyway, you've noticed that I'm going back and forth, not exactly um, indirect quote, direct quote, indirect quote, direct quote, but pretty close, trying to demonstrate how you weave back and forth to guide your story and then use direct quotes to, to give, uh, uh, again, that personality and and expression and emotion in some cases uh, to make it more interesting. So anyway, so this was, as I said, and then at the bottom, that's I've added to it for the purpose of this class that I want you to bring in your sources. So go ahead and give the uh, uh, name, the their, their uh, phone number, their email address. So if I choose to check up, if I think for some reason, uh, I'm not so sure this is a true story, I can check up on, on you. And if, you're, if you uh, have photos, uh, include a caption. Uh, for any photo that needs a caption, include the caption. Give me the, your, uh, the name of the photo, if you're giving us more than one photo. And uh, so link the caption with the name of the photo. I, I mentioned mine, you know, trying to expedite this rather quickly. But I had, I'm presenting that I had a lot of photos of speakers and so uh, just name line, that is just their name will be under some of the photos, but most, mostly head and shoulders sort of thing. The expression, but head and shoulders. Um, and then uh, if, if, you know, I had one picture that I thought could go to the top of the page, and I went ahead and uh, and gave a caption for that. Um, again, one thing I kind of skipped over up here was I added also uh, E underneath content. Did you provide photos and or other graphics to, to help illustrate and promote your story? I talked about that in Monday. That's very, very important to have some graphic with your, some graphics, photographs, or other types of graphics with your story. Uh, without it, it, it becomes quite challenging to uh, design a, a good page. And so everybody's responsible for bringing some kind of graphic, photographic content with their story. Uh, so uh, that it can be used effectively in a, in a news page. Uh, if you don't have good graphics that, uh, as I said, as a designer, as you start designing a page and you get somebody's story that they didn't have any graphics with, you're going to be upset with them. You're going to be talking to them later. Where are my graphics? Because that will inhibit how, you, how, you can, uh, how nicely you can design that page. A story without any graphics at all, you have basically a couple of choices. One is make sure that in your design that becomes a one column, a one column story with some graphics mixed to it in a different story. So you can make it a one column story and diminish its, uh, its position on the page. Um, the other thing you can do is you can create a graphic and oftentimes this is a pull out, a pull out quote. So you take a quote out of it and you, you make it bigger letters and we'll go over how to do pull out quotes, uh, when we get into desktop publishing. But even I mean, on the fly, you can create a graphic, but uh, it's not uh, not a photograph. Uh, you can even put it in a box, a shadow box, and colorize it. You you can do some stuff graphically without having a photograph. Uh, but uh, you don't want to have too many stories like that. Let me put it that way. Uh, you want very few stories where the only graphic is one you created with a pullout quote or something. Okay, so we've covered that. 
Um, any questions on your stories? That will be coming up, I think, in two weeks. Uh, you're supposed to, I think it's week four, you're supposed to hand in your story. Well, not next week, but in week four. Pretty sure that's what I have in the current uh, syllabus. We can double check. The syllabus is still not totally done because I'm trying to put enough detail so that you can uh, really follow it. Uh, so let's go back in here and uh, look at the current syllabus. And I think we'll see that in week four, your stories do. So week four, major project one due to be completed by Monday. So I give you the weekend to work on it in case you, you need it. But uh, so it's basically, actually it's due the first day of week five in essence. And Monday more, by Monday morning in week, uh, week five, your, your story is to be done. So you have, you know, this week you're to hand in your minor project, which is three story ideas. Uh, next week we will uh, you know, talk a little bit more about uh, uh, about what your contents may be in your actual story, and uh, then in week four you you will have uh, you need to finish that story, so you need to be working on it. And obviously it's nice if you can start working on it before the last week, um, like immediately, start rounding up your sources, start interviewing, and so forth as quickly as you can. So, again, any questions on, on your major project one? Uh, again, that'll be nine points, uh, nine, percentage, nine percentage points from your 100 points uh, for, your, for our class. It'll be almost one-tenth of your grade. Um, the, there, are other, there are three other major projects also worth nine, so altogether they're worth 36% of your grade. Your final exam is worth 50, so between your final exam of 50 per, that's worth 50 percent of your grade again I didn't control that somebody else dictated that in creating the syllabus that was accepted that was sent to the Ministry of Education which so makes it written in stone basically uh, so other than the uh, your 50 percent final exam and your 36 percent myth four major projects obviously that only leaves 14 percent for everything else your presentations your minor projects your quizzes all of that is only worth 14% of your overall grade. So um, do well with your major projects. Uh, let me uh, I just very quickly, hopefully, it's the, the chapter on, uh, on macro editing. Oh, something else, uh, let me point out before I get to that, because it also will help me see where I'm at here. Um, uh, something else that I sent you in, your, in the previous announcement, and if you weren't signed up yet, you would not have gotten it. Um, did I put it elsewhere? Yeah, I think I sent it out, but I don't think I posted it. Maybe I should post it also. Uh, but in the announcement that I sent out uh, previously last week, let me bring that up. You also received a, uh, well, let me see. Maybe this isn't. Yeah, it is. Um, this is the revised version of the uh, of the assignments, uh, just generic without any names in it. And so this is where I've I've uh, changed the date of your presentation. So again, people that were to present in next week and week three are presenting in week four and so forth. Um, and the uh, new subjects, if somebody hasn't, well, first off, maybe we signed up for for uh, the the uh, the last week for chapters 15 is, or chapters 16 and 17, I guess it were, it was, uh, it now has chapter one instead. I made that decision arbitrarily, just because it's kind of similar, fairly easy content for whoever was, and it's still in the same place last week. So not knowing exactly your incentive for signing up for that last one, I don't think this would 
be contrary to your your motivation. Uh, and I did add one more in here. Oh, editing for style, spelling, and tightening was not on the list before, and so nobody signed up for it yet because it has not. I forgot to bring the list to to pass around. Uh, so you have that. But what I was looking at then. Making sure I didn't. Okay. Anyway, so I want to talk sh shortly here. I talked yesterday about, about reporting, uh, news reporting, or not news reporting. I did not cover that. I will cover that next week regardless, um, two and three. Um, I'll cover the, the techniques for news reporting next week. Even though you're starting news reporting now, uh, that will be a next week subject. So this week I'm going to very quickly uh, go through macro editing uh, for the big picture. Uh, some uh, it's also sometimes called holistic editing and uh, so I'm going to review that real quick since nobody in this class is doing it but probably um, I mean there's aspects to it that are important but uh, anyway I, the reason why I put it at first was that it's a good overview chapter but it's not critical chapter uh, when we talk about holistic editing, we're talking about it, it involves uh, recognition that uh, at, at one time of all the various patterns a particular story fits and how it might differ from, from what's typical, the lookout for uh, creative variations that introduce intelligence, fresh approaches, and so forth. Um, holistic editing is uh, the sort of editing in part that I mentioned content editors do. Content editors, that, such as the Metro editor, who's overseeing the work of the reporters, has to look at this in a, from a very holistic way, uh, including graphics, by the way. I mentioned uh, graphics for your stories. Uh, the the uh, Metro editor and other content editors have to be thinking about graphics as well as, as the story itself. Uh, they're looking at all the sources. What sources did you use? What questions did you ask? So uh, when we talk about holistic editing, uh, there is some concern about flow and spelling and grammar and so forth, but their primary responsibility is to look beyond the spelling and grammar and looking at the overall impact of the story. Is this story a valuable story? Is it newsworthy? Did you cover it well? Did you ask the right people, uh, the right people, the right questions, and so forth? So they're looking at it in a broader sense. Um, so stories have the same basic components, and, and no matter what their subject is. One thing that this does point out in this uh, chapter kind of reviews all the sorts of stories that a that a metro editor especially might be uh, might be looking at. Uh, as you're, uh, before I get to that though, basically as a holistic in doing holistic editing, you're first off uh, reading the uh, pull this down a little bit. You're going to read the entire text. Uh, you want to read it in a way that uh, without editing. I find that very difficult to do as an editor. If I am uh, uh, going through going through a story, I, I try to go through it fairly quickly, but it's very hard for me not to stop and make corrections sometimes. Uh, but none of that's the idea. That's the general policy. Is if you're a holistic editor, a content editor, you're first off reading to get the overall perspective of the story. What's the stubber? This story really uh, contain? Is it newsworthy? Uh, is it uh, is it credible? Is it you know, does it include everything I need included in it as the uh, as a content editor? I'll bring my I'm not quite sure what's going on here. Okay. Um, so, um, uh, then you uh, start going through it more carefully, uh, like such a, we call it a, using your fine tooth comb uh, to go through it. And you're now uh, uh, looking for typos, you're looking for punctuation problems and grammar problems. 
Again, if you're the Metro editor, that may not be uh, your primary concern either. Uh, let me say that not all organizations are organized. They don't have a big enough staff to do it the way I described it before, to have, whole, to have content editors and separate copy editors. Um, one of the reasons why I like being the editor and publisher of, of a weekly uh, newspaper instead of a daily newspaper is that I can do more things. I can do a lot of the writing. Uh, I can also be a content editor and and the copy editor both. And I'm pretty good at both. And so I like being an editor or publisher of a weekly newspaper or a group of weekly newspapers, which I've done a lot of my, my career. Uh, but in that case, I'm going to wear more hats than, than if I'm in a daily newspaper. That's one thing. That's why I didn't like working at the daily, daily newspaper. Uh, even though I was there for six years uh, full time and then six years part time, uh, I did not like being a cog in a machine. Which I felt like, as a as a member of a fifty person staff, very everybody had their own specialty. They had did one thing and only one thing, basically one very focused job. And uh, I didn't like doing that. I like I like more freedom, I like doing more stuff. And so I enjoyed, of course, being my own boss as publisher, but I also enjoyed being my being the editor and being part of both the content editing and the copy editing. Of stories, in which case all of this is appropriate for what I was doing uh, in a daily newspaper that has lots of employees, 50 or, as I mentioned, Washington Post has had over 900 at one point. Obviously, you become even more specialized the bigger your staff. Uh, you don't need people redoing the same stuff over and over again, so you get more specialized, not less. Um, okay, so definitely in my case, I was definitely doing step B as well. Uh, going through uh, as a copy editor, uh, you as, want to look at it as a, from the big picture, make sure the structure of the text makes sense, the information uh, is in the right order, does it flow from one idea to the uh, next uh, easily and smoothly, is everything uh, uh, clearly explained, are there unanswered questions, uh, is any information missing. So that is more the content editor. Uh, you're looking as I've already said several times, you're looking to make sure that all the questions have been answered. You've asked the right people the right questions uh, to provide, provide the right answers. And if not, then you as the content editor have to send the reporter back out to redo some of their work. So that's that big picture in a large organization is done by a content editor uh, differently, working separately and differently than the copy editor. Fact checking. Uh, check everything, verify names and, and titles, check date, dates and, and uh, locations, uh, do the math, check uh, summaries of reports, data, and so forth. Uh, depending how large your organization uh, and how much time you have to do it, you can do more or less of the fact checking. But the minimal is to make sure uh, that they spelled the person's name the same way every time. And if they haven't, Make sure you know which is the right way to spell their name. Names are very important. Uh, make sure uh, they mention the statistics. Make sure that the statistics add up, that they make sense. So if they're, in some cases, uh, I've seen stories where they add up to more than 100%. What does that mean? Uh, was it based on the fact that some people could answer more than once? Or is somebody just making a mistake here? Uh, you know, there's just, you have to look at the facts as best you can. Um, and if you have any questions that you cannot, cannot answer, uh, then you bring in that reporter again and you get him to clarify, uh, are you sure about this? Uh, do you need to double check it? Uh, this doesn't make, you know, I have questions about this, but I can't, I don't have, I don't have access to the report that you use to create this story or whatever it might be. So you, you may have to bring in the reporter again to do some, uh, make sure that the facts are, are accurate. Um, mostly you're trying in this point with the time that you have and the resources you have, uh, you're, you're just, you're let, allowing yourself to be suspicious. You know, how could this reporter screw up? And you're looking for a screw up. So you're, you're going to look at all his facts and, and try to ask, you know, ask yourself, does this make sense? Is there, could he have fouled this up somehow? 
and uh, be a little bit skeptical as you're looking at his facts or her facts, as the case might be. Uh, then uh, step E is to revise. Again, I, as I mentioned the other day, uh, you own the article once you receive it, especially the copy edit, the copy desk. Uh, it, it is true of the content editor if uh, if he chooses to own it. As I said, the content editor has the option of handing it back to the reporter and telling him to redo some stuff. So um, it is possible that uh, again, a, an editor might not do all the revision himself. He may ask the reporter to do some revision. Uh, once it gets to the copy desk, it's presumed, again, in a large organization, that the that the content editor has done this stuff. They've gone over the, the contents enough that they're mostly now worrying about spelling and grammar and flow um, and then laying out the page, writing a headline, that sort of stuff is the function of the copy editor. Uh, so in, in a large organization, some of these steps are taken by more than one person. And in the revision, um, at this point, most of the revision should have already been done by the content editor and or the reporter himself. But there are cases where the uh, copy editor feels obliged to do some rewriting. Maybe the lead, maybe the bridge, maybe that the person is trying to do a, a conclusion and you don't like that. It's hard to know. But the copy editor is the last one to see that story, so the copy editor is the one who has final say. Uh, even though he may not have the highest title, it is his job to be the last person to touch that story. And so any mistakes that are left in that story are now the copy editor's problem. He owns it now. So you need to make any revisions you have to. Um, and then uh, step F, many editors will write display type, headlines, head headers, so forth. This particularly uh, is the responsibility primarily of the copy editor. And he's not just writing them, he's actually producing uh, the desktop, he does the desktop publishing. And uh, that's why I almost refuse to do teach this class without desktop publishing. Because it's within that environment that an editor in this day and age is working. Uh, it has been since, I mean, like I said, there's a transition period. But the daily newspaper I was at and, and all of my own newspapers after 1986 were done with some form of desktop publishing. So this is not a new science here. Uh, other newspapers took a while to get to it, but by the end of the 1990s, I think all newspapers were now uh, doing some form of desktop publishing uh, before the turn of the century. Uh, and now it's, uh, I, I can't imagine a copy editor not doing their own desktop publishing. So uh, you, you now it's a, it's a requirement before it was not necessarily a requirement uh, that you know desktop publishing. As an editor, you should know desktop publishing. Uh, at least it will open up a lot of doors that would not be open to you otherwise, for sure. This kind of goes through very quickly the, all the different types of stories. Yes, you can. There are historical or personality profiles, uh, things like that, chronological narratives. I just got to jump through some of the stuff. Um, some of those are more in the feature section. You obviously have political stories that, uh, to deal with. And the same, the same uh, editor may have to deal with all of these. So you kind of have to understand that with a different story, you may have different problems to, to face. Um, with political stories, you, you may have uh, polls, a lot of polls and statistics from polls. You have to understand that those, uh, you have to be a little skeptical of polls, as anybody who followed the uh, U.S. presidential election found out is that uh, everybody thought all the polls were showing, oh great, um, that Hillary was going to win the election, and it turned out they were wrong. I was following some of the, I followed a, a whole bunch of different polls, and there was one that was uh, out of the, I think it was University of, of uh, Southern California, where they, it was, they were following the same people uh, they had, it was the largest poll that was being, one of the largest polls being done in America, 
and they were following the same people week after week and seeing how they changed their minds. That turned out to be the most accurate poll. A lot of the, a lot of the polls were based on just a couple hundred people that were supposedly randomly selected, uh, but once you get the, the number lower, uh, if you're not talking about a couple thousand, or th I think this may have even been the, the one from USC was perhaps even 4,000, I don't remember, four or 5,000. Once you get below 1,000, you start having question marks. Uh, and you get to 200, even bigger question marks. And a lot of the polls that were being pushed by the major media in America were small numbers. Uh, and they were, they were uh, prone to more uh, possible errors. And so I was following that very carefully and very curious to see because this